Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, eight o'clock and we hit our magical 30 participants. It seems like there's 30 people who are always on time and then a number of others who uh, trickle in as the hour continues. So today, it's my um, great pleasure, first of all, to announce that um, we saved the best for last. And um, our last speaker for Pathology Grand Rounds 2020 is uh, Dr. Brandy McCleskey. And uh, I'm sure everybody's happy to see 2020 come to an end. Um, we will still be via Zoom, at least in the beginning of the year. We've started to put together the calendar and you should be receiving that hopefully before the end of the year. We will take, um, it looks like the next three weeks off before we resume in 2021. So today, as I said, Dr. McCluskey will be talking to us. Um, she started her training, um, her collegiate training in Arkansas State before receiving her MD from the University of Arkansas. And then we were fortunate enough to recruit her to UAB um, where she completed her residency and continued on through her fellowship. And I think she liked us enough and we were fortunate enough to retain her as an assistant professor um, just three years ago in 2017, where she's really and quickly made herself um, indispensable for pathology. She's currently the director of the longitudinal program in pathology curriculum. And I saw that just this year, which has to be a trying year to um, have the second hat, is a School of Medicine representative in the UAB Suicide Prevention Leadership Team. I can only imagine the increased need for that this year. Um, she contributes to UAB mission um, as primarily from the clinical side as the associate coroner medical examiner of Jefferson County. And as you'll see today, she really has a passion and drive for education, um, which I've gotten to see the last few days um, setting this up. With her clinical hat, she's performed um, well over 600 autopsies and has um, appeared in a number of court cases, um, both in front of a jury as well as a judge as expert witness. From her mentoring and teaching roles, um, what I found most impressive is it's not just teaching the residents. Her passion for education um, trickles all the way down to the high school level um, and everything in between. And what's impressive from her CV is not only does she have all these clinical duties and teaching roles, um, she still manages to publish a number of papers, has a number of other manuscripts um, pending, as well as a number of published abstracts in other areas, such as um, the role of addiction and overdose and the deaths in our community and beyond. Um, so with that, would you um, please join me in welcoming Dr. McCleskey and I will hand the mic over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, it's always fun to sort of get to hear about your journey. Um, I first want to thank you guys for inviting me. It's exciting to sort of be finishing out the, the Grand Rounds tour for this semester. I also want to say a special thank you to some of our guests that are logging in from afar, um, particularly some of our resident applicants uh, for this cycle and many others. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. Let's see. All right, so my the title of my talk is Back to the Future, um, Expanding the Gateway to Pathology by Returning to the Medical School. So some others also refer to this as the pathology pipeline. Of course, I have no relevant financial disclosures, but I do want to have a little uh, trigger warning. Here it is, 2020. I may get a little too excited. I'm uh, fairly passionate about this topic, and um, so I don't want you to take offense, but there may be some distressing topics that we'll talk about today. I like to give you a roadmap of where we're going. Um, so I think in order to know what we're gonna do for the future, we have to know where we came from. So we'll have a little bit of a history lesson, talk about where we are now, and if it has affected us at all and what maybe we could do for the future. Um, I'll be sort of driving this journey along this journey today, but I'll have a few special guests to really drive the points home for me. So just to sort of look back, um, you could take pathology all the way back to the Egyptian embalmings, right? Before, before the common era when, um, when they would embalm the, the uh, kings and the pharaohs and but there's very little records that remain from that time and then you can move into the era of Hippocrates and Aristotle who really 
even then described inflammation and tuberculosis. Um, and then the Alexandrian Greeks who made significant contributions to both anatomy and pathology. And even as far back as a Roman writer, writer Celsus who described the classic four stages of inflammation that we still talk about. Galen was one that um, came right after the turn of the century or the common era rather. Um, and he followed the Hippocratic theory and, and really expanded the value of animal dissection. And we do have some records from these times. But really, um, since human dissection was outlawed at that time, medical knowledge and advancement stalled for quite some time until the Italians finally recognized human dissection and the value of that in, in theaters such as the one you see here. And then again, we hit another road bump, a uh, roadblock. And then in the 15th century, we have um, Antonio Benavini, who performed and recorded findings from his autopsies. And then Jean Fresnel, who was a mathematician turned pathologist who actually diagnosed a case of acute appendicitis through autopsy. Later on in the 17th, or, uh, 17th century, William Harvey really revolutionized medicine and disease with his publication and then moved on to Bonnet's um, account of more than 3,000 autopsy reports. And these were really driving the advancement of medicine at the time. It wasn't really until the 17th century that Morgogni, who's really regarded as the father of anatomic pathology, published his complete integration of um, over 645 or 646 patient accounts, both the clinical and the pathologic correlations and the autopsy findings. This really set the stage for the organ basis of disease, and that really continued on until the mid 1800s. Um, Bailey, following his uncle, John Hunter, who's a very famous surgeon, um, published this beautiful textbook with complete with pathology images. And then we move into the 1800s with Bouchat and Hodgkin, who then began to publish their tissue-based observations. The mid 1800s are notable for names such as Moeller, Rokotansky, Ver Verkow. Of course, the advent of the microscope and really an explosion of cellular pathology. Verkow was a, um, a proponent of using those microscopes during his autopsies and this really created an explosion of more of cellular basis of disease. It still was in the late uh, 19th century, late 1800s, finally professors of pathology were being recognized by medical schools. Before then, many different types of doctors did um, autopsies, but it was really that histopathologic, that microscopic description that was setting them apart. Here you see uh, von Recklinghausen, who was an experimental and anatomic pathologist who really left his mark on all of pathology from bone pathology to, to uterine pathology to of course, um, neurofibromatosis. Uh, and, then, and then we really hit our stride. So in the, in the late 19th century and the turn of the, the 20th century, we have Klebs who um, really established the link between bacteriology and infectious disease describing endocarditis. Conheim, who described the origin of, of what was called the pus cell and Weigert um, who, who described degeneration and necrosis. Then in the early 1900s, we really start seeing those basic histopathologic features um, recorded that we still use today. Here you see Mary Reed, notably the only woman I've shown you so far, but one that was very pivotal in, in describing the Reed Sternberg cell. Um, Ashoff described the reticuloendothelial cell. They went on to an um, on, on Itchkoff, who described atherosclerosis, and of course, Carl Landsteiner, who just who um, came up with the basis of blood typing that we still use today. In the mid 1900s, um, fluorescent anti uh, labeled antibodies, monoclonal antibodies uh, hit hit the stage, and of course, PCR methods were expanded by Mollus. In the late 20th century, we get an expansion now of a morphology-based diagnostic pathway and really molecular pathology. So it, you can see that the the timeline's not very long to go from the organ system to the cellular system now to really down to the molecular um, aspects. So um, now we're in this age of digital pathology and data explosion. And, and I thought it was very interesting. You know, some of us that are newer to the field think the blue books have been around forever when really this sort of explosion of molecular data and, um, and, and I, I guess you could say chapters to the blue books are, is really um, due to the, the advancements in the 2000s. 
So, I, you know, when I was going through this, I thought, well, this is a really exciting history and, and it shows that we're not, um, you know, although pathology has been around for a while, we're really still poised to do a lot of greatness. And so I thought this was a very um, nice segue into what's coming is, is, you know, when you think about what we've gone through, especially this year in 2020, pathologists really are the reconnaissance teams. We, we determine the enemy disposition, the intention, the composition, their capabilities. And we and we help devise a strategy for attack and and that it really to continue our relevance, we need to maintain active involvement in continuous medical research and continue to progress the field of medicine. So let's talk a little bit about where we are today. So I'm going to talk about the era that we know, which is pre COVID, of course, um, COVID has has uh, revolutionized a whole lot of our our field, but Healthcare expenditures have always been increasing, at least in the recent past, um, at, at substantive rates. But really, when you look at it, which they did in 2018, um, you see the charts here, the lab tests actually only represent a minimal amount of those expenditures. But what we influence is, is vast. So over 94% of the structured data in the electronic medical record is due to laboratory tests in general. Um, those tests provide the basis for over 70% at least of medical decisions. And in those patients with infections, neoplasia, myocardial infarction, drug, drug monitoring needs, mostly in patients, it informs decisions in almost 100% of them. So we're vital to patient care. We have significant impacts on value-based care and population health in general. I think that's very clear, um, especially this year. And so our role really is to balance, you know, the, the quality with um, a quality improve our quality improvement role with with quality output. And so you see here on on the the image and the and the bottom of the slide, we really have to to balance that speed and accuracy of diagnosis with understanding that there's an, a patient on the other end or medical management plan that needs to be initiated, but our value and, and the process that we go through should be recognized. Um, you'll see a fair amount of quotes from this 2020 publication um, in academic pathology because I think, I think it's really true. The engagement of a pathologist who discusses proactively with both the clinician and, and even the patient really um, can drive those that, that value and without effective engagement from experts, we might continue to, to contribute to poor clinical outcomes and increased cost. This publication also did a very good job of outlining some domains that we can add value to what we do. And so I thought it was worthwhile mentioning them here. Um, four different areas of that, utilization management. So education and consultation regarding test ordering. We do some of that. There's probably room to do more. And it's not just about overutilization test of tests, but actually underutilization of tests that contribute most to delayed diagnoses. We really should be increasing our consultative role and, and working to help develop quality and database support tools for our clinicians. In the world of precision medicine, we need to make sure that we're active in, in determining the true value of a test and, and necessitate the expense that's really needed. Um, we should be involved more in research and health services so that we can continue to demonstrate our true, true value because if anything, if we, don't, if we don't scream from the rooftops what we can do, no one else is gonna do it for us. We should improve resident training for test assessment, increase involve, involvement in testing algorithms and guidelines in an effort to help reduce diagnostic errors. Of course, the autopsy is the historical starting point, but I think anything, if, if anything else that 2020 showed us, it, it's that accurate death certification and compromised mortality data is a big problem. We should be providing feedback to both the clinicians and ourselves in order to learn from our mistakes and, and, and really directly engage with, with patients so that we can continue to improve population health. And that drives me to that brings me to improving healthcare outcomes. We should, we should be empowered by the, the data that we have. If anything, we've, we've shown our value in a response to a pandemic. And we should address our needs and engage with payers and administrators and discuss, discuss true cost versus true value. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that we could go about doing this ourselves, but, but in, in rele relevant to this talk, we could also just educate future clinicians about how to utilize 
um, on utilization management. We could educate future clinicians about the pathologist role in precision medicine. We could also educate future clinicians on the mistakes of the past so that they don't make the mistakes in the future. And we could educate future clinicians on how to improve population health and healthcare outcomes. If we wanna accomplish all of these goals, we could educate future pathologists who can carry that torch on for us. So why are we doing that? Where did, where did pathology go? Where did the pathologist go in medical, in medical school? Um, I like to say it wasn't that long ago that I was there and I had to go seek it out myself as well. The curriculum uh, model really shifted probably uh, maybe to, two decades now into a more integrative model. Some at the time and even past that time argued that learning pathology and undergraduate medical education was a burden, that there's really no need for doctors to learn the patho pathologic basis of disease, which I hope there are a number of eyes rolling on the other side of this camera. But we have to prepare future clinicians for the genomic era of medicine and they must understand the nature of a disease. Systems-based pathology was actually integrated into the clinical years of medical school in the 80s and 90s, but by 1999, almost 80, almost 80 percent, over 75 percent at least, of U.S. medical schools taught an unintegrated pathology course. We knew in 2001 that didactic lectures with minimal interaction was outdated, and yet they're still a mainstay in the curriculum. This integrative model and a lack of really figuring out where we fit in reduced the visibility of pathology education. And, and there was a perception that it wasn't happening and maybe still is that perception. And there really, there really should be and there is, uh, there really should be representation of pathologists on centralized curriculum committees. Because again, if we don't talk about how important it is, no one else is going to. When you think about pathology in general, we've all seen these curves over the last few years, the doom and gloom of our profession. Um, in 2013, I think Rob Boy was the president of CAP at the time or shortly thereafter, but they produced a publication looking at active pathologists at that time. There were almost 18,000 of them, um, not all of them board certified. They, were, they reported they were working an average of nearly 50 hours per week. Um, at that time, they reported that the anticipation retire, re anticipated retirement age was going to be 71 and that we would see that retirement peak um, in this coming year, actually. They re re revised the publication in 2019 and found that there were, um, at that time, 20, a little over 21,000 active pathologists, which if you look at their gap that they, were they um, estimated in 2013, that's really not that far off from where they thought we would be. It was expected that by 2020, almost 5,000 um, pathologists would have retired and that we would see a boom in retirement over the next decade with about 6,000 retiring. So in order to address this gap, we really must build the pathology empire, but are we actually doing that? So in 1926, there were very few training programs, but if you think about that history lesson I just uh, reminded you on of, there was a boom of pathology information in the mid 1900s and really there were about 700 pathology training programs. Now in 2000 that was consolidated to around 150 hopefully that was a value added decision, of course. Um, and in 2013, that same Rob Boy publication showed that there were 583 PGY-1 positions generating um, over the course of four years, 2,400 total residents. And what they said at that time was to fill this gap, we needed an immediate increase each year of 8%. And so I've shown you here the 2020 data, we currently only have 603 entry positions, which if you do the math is less than 8% in a total of seven years. Um, there are 600 and there are 164 programs currently there are 603 entry positions and only a little over a third of those are filled by US seniors. UAB hasn't done a terrible job over the last five cycles. Um, we've generated 10 entering pathologists, um, but I would say with an entering class of over 180 students each year, we might have some room for improvement. We need to really drive home the point that pathologists are critical members of the healthcare provider team. We're physicians, we're consultants, we can improve quality, cost effectiveness, but we really have to train the, a new generation of pathologists who understand the role of pathology and value-based care and precision medicine 
and we have to generate the evidence that supports our value and proactively engage in educating not just students and other stakeholders, but all everyone within and outside the healthcare system. So what is the pathologist educator? I, I am among friends when we talk about competing de demands on faculty time. There is significant risk for stress and burnout among, among, um, among faculty educators, but it is critical to make a distinction between pathology as a career and pathology as an important medical science. We are vital in the, important, in the development of physician scientists. The physician scientist research pathway is well under construction here, and we're hoping to, to give that a, a new life as we move forward. But we really have to modify our approaches to meet the learner. We can't really compromise what must be learned, which sometimes gets a little fuzzy, but we, we really need to meet the learner where they are. And in order to do that, you have to know your audience. And, and so students um, these in, in these, these days are really, according to the research, are overall very assertive and they do have high expectations, but they are at a very high risk for stress, anxiety, burnout. I can't even imagine growing up in a world where there was social media from day one. They are very intelligent. They thrive in interactive learning experiences delivered in shorter segments. And they are really good at utilizing commercial products and there are a lot of commercial products that have capitalized on that. They love pre-recorded lectures. They really are starting to value digital study, study aids more than professors, which is a problem because we really have to train physicians for the 21st century. They have to understand modern decision-making. They have to be able to integrate the what, the factual knowledge, the how, the why, and that really needs to be built on a solid foundation of biomedical science and pathobiology of disease. But overall, we still need to create holistic, empathic, and compassionate professionals who can take care of our patients. So my question is, well, then do they know us? I've described barrier-breaking professors, innovators before their time, Nobel laureates, investigators that really laid the foundation and a specialty that's poised to thrive in the 21st century. But let's hear from, from of our students and see if they actually understand that. What was your vision of pathology before you started this course? Like when you thought about pathology, what was like the image that came to mind? Do what? The basement. The basement, okay. <clears throat> A microscope. Slides. Slides. So technical sort of components. What about a person? Did you have a visual image of what the person might look like or the field in general? Research oriented. You can be, be honest. You love histology. Love histology. Not a lot of human interaction. Okay. Lacking human interaction. Anything else? Like a blank box, except that doesn't have humans and has a microscope slides and it's located in the basement. <laughs> Good to know. Oh, and it likes to do research. So what you're gonna hear a little bit more in this talk are, are um, accounts from a course that I taught and we're gonna talk a little bit more about it, but those are our current, um, current third year um, medical students. So what I think that drives us to now is an age of opportunity. So pathology really does serve as the link between medical science and clinical medicine. And we really should focus on educating students on the basics of disease, the relevant, not the rarities. We should emphasize underlying principles and help them understand what the quote unquote, the lab is and what quality control is. That's our expertise. We're a problem solving field and we should encourage problem solving through diagnostic um, knowledge. We really can provide integrative concepts at the very beginning of their medical school curriculum. And I see great value in utilizing the gold standard teaching tool, the autopsy, and hopefully you'll agree with me at the end of this. This is another account from one of my students this just a couple weeks ago. The autopsy was one of my favorite things I did in all four years of school. And I felt incredibly privileged, not to mention getting my tuition's worth when I was in the autopsy room. Had I known, I would have considered going into pathology. She spent literally three hours with me in an autopsy suite. And this is the value that that added. 
So I want to talk a little bit about utilizing autopsy in undergraduate medical education. I know it has been in the past, and I know it's not without its obstacles for the future, but the opportunities really are vast. It's got, of course, the longest record for improving safety and outcomes. It epitomizes problem-based learning with, by using a variety of teaching methods. We can talk about anatomy. We can talk about clinical patho pathologic correlation, pathophysiology, death certification, help clinicians understand bereavement and how to counsel their patients on that. Actually, the autopsy in one study ranked even higher than podcasts, which students these days love. And it really, now for the 21st century, we could utilize autopsy tissues and data to help uh, and, and next generation sequencing to really help understand the genetic and molecular basis of disease. It of course is not without its obstacles. There are um, a number of efforts for re reducing healthcare costs and there's really no reimbursement there. Um, of course, declining rates of autopsies is a problem. I would suggest due to, or I would um, yeah, suggest due to reluctant, albeit uninformed clinicians, since they're the ones having to ask for the autopsy, it's perceived as unnecessary or a waste of time. And I hope that's not true of anyone on this call. And there is uh, over across the country, um, a lack of dedicated autopsy faculty, a lack of time to accomplish this and really a lack of facilities. We're very lucky here that that's not the case. And so I, I capitalized on that. I started a course in, the 20, in 2019 called How the Dead Can Teach the Living. Of course, it's a catchy name. The students love that. The maximum class size, had, class size had to be increased within hours. It generated a wait list very quickly. And at the end of that, the students um, remarked that they realized what the patient care role of the pathologist is. Those blank box kids, uh, students from previously, these are their, that's their feedback. Now they understand that pathology is interactive. They understand that it's a collaborative field. They they understood what the, 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 the impact the autopsy can have on population health. And I assure you, there's at least 13 students out there who are really leery about mortality data because they understand um, death certificates are very important. This year's class just ended a couple weeks ago. I had to increase the class size yet again. Of course, it was taking, taking place during COVID and in a hybrid setting, but what was really fantastic is the advent of virtual meetings. And so they got to attend the National Association of Medical Examiners meeting this year and present a topic to their classmates which they really enjoyed. What you see on the right side of the, the slide here is the overview or the syllabus of the, the class, which was really could really be replicated anywhere. So do you think the experience was worth it? I think what was interesting to me was the fact that, you know, I entered the autopsy suite and my guy literally, you know, it looked like he could have been sleeping there because he had no, like he was not traumatic or anything. And so um, I think that was kind of interesting that he looked okay and he died of something that was, you know, relatively preventable. He was only 52 years old. And so the fact that he just never received medical care for, hypertension, you know, hydrochlorothiazide is not an expensive drug, but he had never, you know, gone to the doctor to receive any medical treatment. It struck me is that, you know, we've obviously dealt with our cadavers and um, done a lot of dissections, but it's so different when you're seeing a body that's only, you know, the person's only been dead for 24 hours or less. I mean, to hold someone's heart that was not beating very long ago in your hands is a pretty sobering experience. And my grandmother was a nurse and she was telling me that when she was in on deliveries, that that was kind of what made her think about like the weight of life and the meaning of it and things like that. And I got to do or help with the special, the special delivery day that the OBGYN group does. And yes, it was a really, you know, cool moment to see the parents happy with their baby. But for me, I think honestly seeing like the autopsy was more of like a meaning of life thing for me. I don't know. I'm sure that's different for everybody, but like the, the death made me think about it more than the life. So I'd say they agree that it might be worth it. And, and I, I put some uh, topics that are important um, in medical education these days, of course, social determinants of health. It seems like our patients, uh, especially mine at the coroner's office can help teach those. So what else can the patient um, learn? I think help sort them? of continuing off of what Mimi said, sort of a similar thing that it made, it made death like a lot more tangible. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it um, you know, sort of the criticism, some of the criticisms that we've kind of like poked fun at about pathologists, people make about pathologists is like, well, we don't take care of patients or, uh, or, you know, pathologists don't take care of patients um, and, and stuff like that. But, and then another thing, sort of, if you guys remember last week with um, the talk we had last week, 
one of the speakers uh, sort of made a joke about how his father's an oncologist, like he wasn't going to go to his office and be like, do you have cancer? You know, how can I trust you to take care of my dad if you don't know? But it's like, you know, we're all going to die. And it's, and the, the cases that uh, I witnessed, and I guess most of the cases there, it's not like, it's not like these, like the causes of death are like, really exotic things. It's like car crashes and house fires. And even, I would say even like gunshot wounds and drug overdoses, it's not like some other, some other group of people that dies from this. It's like, these are all very common things that could happen to any of us. And we will all have to die at some point. So it made it strangely relatable. Like I actually felt like I could relate a lot to the patients because it's like, that can be me. I mean, it's not that hard. That's a very good point. I had like a motor vehicle accident day. The The person that I ended up doing an autopsy on was not actually like the, what got me. I was in there. We had two other um, uh, men, I guess you could say, but they were 21 and 23. And they, it was like a, this was Saturday morning. So they'd gone out and they were like drinking and hanging out with friends. And then they got in a car drunk without their seat belts and ended up dead the next morning. And it just like was horrible. I just like couldn't even function when we walk in the room because they were perfect young people that looked just like us. And like, it just got me the whole day um, because how many people have messed up and just like driven drunk or not called an Uber or not put on your seat belt and had no consequence for that mistake. And so I just like, I called my cousins that are that age and was like, hey, just a reminder. <laughs> It's not, it can happen. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone else has that experience, but I I know we're not all perfect and we make mistakes, but don't make those mistakes. Call an Uber, put your seatbelt on because that was horrible. And those people's families, it's just horrible. So I don't know if you, um, if you notice, but if you watch their faces, they're all very engaged. And I would, I would argue that maybe um, this experience helped save a few lives possibly, um, or made, um, more holistic positions out of this group. So what what was the feedback? I did not like the autopsy. Thought it was horrible. Learned so much though. And so please, when you go pitch this to other kids next year, tell them that they don't have to love pathology and they can like be squeamish when they, like your lectures, super didn't enjoy them, but like learned a lot. So like, I, I have learned so much from this course. I honestly think I could be a pathologist and love it every day, like genuinely. So just keep that in mind when you go pitch it to people because you don't have to be thrilled about an autopsy to love this course. So glad I took it. Thank you so much. Oh, you guys. I feel like one of the goals that the course had was to change the perspective that we have about pathologists. And I think that really struck me because I think pathologists are portrayed as people that don't really have patient interactions from my past experience, guaranteed it's very limited because I'm only a second year, but I think that this course really taught me that there's a lot more avenues in pathology than I thought there were and that the lifestyle is not what I had perceived it to be. Um, doing the autopsy was one of my favorite things that I did the entire four years of medical school. So thank you so much for letting us do that. Okay, yeah, something Meta said reminded me about like changing your perspective. It definitely did about autopsies, but and I know you're passionate about what I'm about to say too, but like even the opportunity to hear those two guys speak like the past heroin addicts, I think was like definitely a lifelong lesson that, you know, if, if I got nothing else out of the class, which I got a lot else, you know, out of it, but you know, that would be extremely valuable and worthwhile because it was just crazy. I remember going home and uh, I was telling my wife about it. Like we we're supposed to be on a date or something. We talked for probably two hours after that about like, I just, my mind was blown because I had no idea like what that stuff actually meant. Like, what their experience was and that, you know, people who are drug sick don't really have a choice in what they do. You know, it's just, it's crazy. Like, I mean, the way, the way they explained, it, I mean, y'all were all there, y'all heard it, but it was just definitely blew my mind. Like I did not think about it that way. And it's definitely changed. Even like seeing people walking down the street in Birmingham, just like how I think about this, some of these people and what they're going through. Like I had no idea. So that was, that was crazy. Mind blowing. Um, very valuable. When you guys gave the talks and fundamentals last year, like that was super intriguing because I feel like most of fundamentals, it's like basic science. And then I think it was, it was either Dr. Dyer or Dr. Atherton came in there and gave like 
a lecture on different types of trauma. And I was like, well, this is something we haven't been able to see yet. Like, okay, here's what, you know, hitting someone with a bat looks like and, and stuff like that. And that's part of the reason I signed up because I saw your name on there. And I was like, wait, these are the people who gave the really cool lectures during fundamentals. Like I would like to, you know, participate in the class and, and go forward with it. And the autopsy was like really interesting because uh, we were in neuro when I did mine and we had had the brain anatomy lab and we, you know, got to hold a preserved brain. But then I got to hold this guy's brain that was like producing thoughts 12 hours prior and, you know, just like feel it and look at it. And it was like one of those, whoa, kind of moments that I might not ever get to experience again. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted the opportunity to tell you that the only reason that I took this class was because I wanted to see an autopsy. <laughs> um, and not only did that happen, um, but <laughs> first of all, I enjoyed it. And I can't believe that medical students don't get the opportunity to see an autopsy um, in general, um, because it's an, a completely like night and day difference from the cadavers. Um, second of all, like the timeliness of this course and much less us getting to do that this year and your, you know, the opportunities to do stuff in person. And like, even if you couldn't be in person, like the interactions that we've had with you and the other staff have been amazing and they've been extremely informative and my whole perspective about pathology and pathologists has been completely flipped upside down um and it wouldn't have happened without this and it also well it also wouldn't have i wouldn't have even thought to like look into this if you and dr die hadn't taught in fundamentals so that was like the lead in to this course for me. Um, so I don't know where it's gonna go for me personally and for everyone else in here, but just know that this has, this will, we will never forget this. These students <clears throat> just make my heart so happy. So, um, you know, uh, we can really build off people's interest in forensics. Uh, you know, I, I've told all the applicants, tell everyone we're sort of the sexy side of pathology, but I just want to build more pathologists. So you know, what else can we do? Since I have all of you here and you're all gonna listen uh, listen to me talk for a few more minutes, I have a few ideas. Um, one of which this co-enrollment course format exists here. We should utilize it. I have, I've had an idea for a surgical pathology one. I even have a catchy title, MD and focus. Um, and, you know, goals could really highlight histopathologic basics at the scope to really tie into what they learn in the classroom. In the COVID era, we have a phenomenal peer database that Dr. Anderson has, has built, and we could really utilize um, our future whole slide images as well as the ones we already have. We could, um, they could be organized based on the preclinical curriculum. It can be taught by pathologists and residents, but it really needs a course director. It needs a champion. Um, histopathology practical sessions are still essential to understanding the pathologic basis of disease. My clinical pathologic correlation sessions, which some of you have heard me talk about, and some of you are teaching, they're, they're currently being added to each organ module. There, there really has been outside of Dr. Anderson's fundamentals block and a couple um, organ modules that are run by pathologists at, who win teaching awards every year, little to no pathology is being taught by the pathologist. And we're, we're a robust department. We should be very active in the medical school. The CPC model is not new. It's been published in the New England Journal of Medicine since 1924 with a team of based approach, a clinician present, presenting clinical findings and a pathologist presenting pathologic findings and working together on a diagnosis and treatment. It really helps establish connections with our clinical colleagues. It highlights the pathologist that maintaining visibility part, we're a part of the patient care team. So we need to stay relevant, but these CPC sessions need champions too. Um, pathology, we don't have to start from ground one. Pathology competencies were published in academic pathology back in 2017. They were organized into three different areas um, and there are topics within each. I've utilized these to help build some of the CPCs that we've already done, but we have an opportunity to do more. Um, the, the disease mechanisms and processes are more the fundamental concepts. 
There's a section on organ system pathology, which could really be integrated into all the organ modules. It could help organize the organ modules. It could also provide some, some foundation goals for the CPC mod, um, sessions. And then there's a section for diagnostic med medicine and therapeutic pathology, which there is an evidence-based medicine module in our current curriculum. We, we could be pre present there. Um, the pathway to residency course, could you imagine how much more valuable these, the, these incoming residents were empowered, um, that we could empower them to make decisions regarding lab tests and lab utilization and interpretation. And then we have an opportunity, we can have as many co-enrollment courses as we want. We can also use the competencies to help build better structure within our current rotations. We can use digital pathology to augment the hands-on activities we already have. We can work with our clinical colleagues to add to their clinical rotations. What's keeping us out of the surgery rotation and allowing the students to spend the day in frozen or to follow the specimen? I'd argue that that's how a number of us actually got interested in pathology. We could develop self-directed learning modules for students that are, are, that are going through these rotations. Um, one of my past students sent me an email and said, hey, I'm interviewing for radiology and they have a really great um, uh, program where the, the radiologist can follow the biopsy in the pathology lab. That sounds like a cool idea. I said, yeah, it sure does. OBGYN, we could, we could let them follow the placenta. They could see a perinatal autopsy. They could understand what the pap smear is and why, why cytology is even involved in that. On the medicine rotations, these, these students and even the residents, they should see an autopsy. They should follow their patients. It is okay. Some patients are going to die. They need to be able to understand how to manage that. They need to understand what the lab is. We could do self-directed learning modules on lab tests, interpretation, but we really need to be more intentional with consultative pathology. We heard a, a grand rounds here about three years ago from Mike LaPasada talking about diagnostic management teams and almost came out of my Chair then, we should be integrated into the, the clinical teams. Our residents should serve as contact points for clinicians and patients. Patient access to reports is coming. Let's be proactive. It doesn't have to be a scary thing. Being a relevant member of the patient care team and talking to your patients, I will stand in the front of the line and tell you that it generates well being and job satisfaction. It might be uncomfortable. I deal with them at the worst period of their life. And yet I still find great value in talking to those patients. And I assure you that it generates better patient outcomes. Uh, one thing that we're looking at doing here, if you were to take it back a step, is reinstating the post-sophomore fellowship. I, I'm not sure what the history is or where it went, but it's a very important tool to integrate both the clinical and the research components of what we do. Um, we're, we're considering maybe adding it as an, an, uh, an experience to go abroad. We have international UAB footprints. I think that would be a huge recruitment tool. They could actually experience, learn how to be a pathologist here and then go experience what it's like in a community-based setting um, in another country. We could even work with UME to help identify these applicants at the pre-matriculation stage and get them engaged early on. Many models exist across the country. Um, and here is a publication that was just in academic pathology last year from Iowa, which is a relatively smaller program, um, especially when compared to us. But they've had a, a, in two, 20 years, they've had 126 post-sophomore fellows, 43% um, of them pursued careers in pathology. Um, that represented a majority of the graduates that actually went into pathology, although they did a fairly decent job otherwise, um, even outside of the post-sophomore fellowship year. And those who didn't go into pathology still affirmed that it had a positive influence on their current practice. And I would say that's the, that's the feedback that I get from my students as well, that regardless if they go into pathology or not, they actually understand it a lot better, um, which is one of my primary goals. I want everybody to at least make an educated decision about their future rather than um, just not knowing. So will it matter if we do anything, I don't, you know, will it matter? I guess time will tell, but I think it's important that we not lose sight of our patients and understand that there is a life and a story behind the specimens, behind the disease process. 
we are not locked up in the lab. We all, we're constantly in communication with each other, with um, patients, with clinicians, with the community, and we really should highlight that role um, and help solve diagnostic problems. I think we have a chance to adapt to the opportunities of the future. We had a slump. Let's justify the rise that we're going to see post-COVID um, and really demonstrate that we are valued and that 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 value will, will have to be earned. It's not just going to happen naturally. But what I do know, um, again, this is from uh, the publication this year, is that if we are unwilling to take advantage of these opportunities, it will be viewed as a cost and liability in the same way that perhaps the autopsy has been and pathology will, can, will di diminish as a profession. And I'd sure hate to see that happen. So hopefully you guys can join my, my team of passion players um, and, and the future really has arrived. So I look forward to seeing what we can do. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not give special thanks to my students for allowing me to record them um, and, and feature them today. So of course, if you're not following us on social media, please do so. And that'll be that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McCleskey. As a non-clinician, non-pathologist, I mean, that was just an overwhelming tour de force and makes me realize what I missed by not pursuing that um, profession. Your passion definitely comes through. Thank you. I'm definitely open for questions. She purposely said she wanted to end a little bit early because um, hopefully this is part of some good to discussion on where pathology is going. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for your talk today, Dr. McCleskey. I had a question. Hey, Monica. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. It's something I'm really passionate about is improving the pipeline to pathology. Because again, I, I was one of those people that had a pathologist in my life before med school. And you, know, you were in fact a forensic pathologist and that's just how I got into it. And not everyone is, you know, that lucky. So I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of that obnoxious person in my medical school trying to tell everyone how great pathology is. But one of the difficult conversations that kind of come up over and over again, and it's a conversation I don't know how to answer or partake in, is salary. You know, there's specialties like ophthalmology, dermatology, radiology that don't have great exposure in medical school. Yet they're so competitive and so sought after just because of the salary. And I'm curious, like, what can we do as like a field to be more, I don't know, like to improve the salary, to get hospitals to understand the worth that pathology brings and really also bring that up to like, you know, I don't know, up to par, but kind of also up there to be attractive to medical students. I think those are great, excellent points. And I'm glad there's some strong leaders on this call that could, uh, could help with that. But so from a forensic standpoint, of course, we have um, a national association of forensic pathologists who are fighting for us, who are trying to demonstrate what value we have. Um, forensics is probably the hardest one to, to get um, you know, to, to say, hey, we matter. And, you know, a lot of them are based on, on county governments or state governments, which is, it's hard to, to get bureaucrats to understand why people should care about why, um, why others are dying. Hopefully COVID can help that. You know, we might as well ride the high since we had to deal with the, the, the awfulness. But in general, it's about representation, right? Um, we need people to, to fight for us. You know, we're all busy. We're all very busy. But if we don't scream from the rooftops what we why we matter, I feel like we've had this talk. I've, I've been in I've been here for eight years. I feel like I heard it eight years ago. I'm sure it was it was said 20 years before that. It it's time. It's time to say we matter. I will say salary is not the only contribution that that should matter when you choose a career. And I tell I tell all of those students that you just heard from. I tell them that lifestyle matters. Um, and it matters for especially those of us who are who are, are young moms, who are females, who are who are, you know, looking at a life that's not just sitting at the scope or or, um, you know, we're working all the time. And so that is a real that's a real value that we can add, especially in this era of students like yourself. I don't know if anyone realizes Monica is one of our applicants this year. Um, and, you know, quality of life matters, and we need to capitalize on that as well. I, I can chime in a little bit. First, uh, incredible talk. Thank you very much. And I'm so happy to see 
uh, how uh, many uh, people uh, signed out from outside. So uh, welcome all of you. I think also there is a little bit of mis uh, misconception. Actually, uh, salary in pathology or compensation, if you look at it as, as a package, is uh, is better than our, uh, over. It's better than the fifty percent of of all other specialty. So uh, we're really in the upper half. We're not uh, we're not a an uncompensated or rewarded from from that financial. Of course, I saw so many people commenting about the lifestyle. The others clearly there are other value, not just uh, the lifestyle. There is also the you know we attract the type of people who who are inquisitive, uh, who love science, who uh, love to discovery. So all these factors play in, but, uh, but even the monetary part, uh, it's not, uh, is no longer a detriment uh, to us. Clearly we could be compensated more and matters if you're in the academic versus uh, private. So there are some uh, astronomical numbers uh, if you're in the private field. And the other thing is, uh, with genomics, uh, with AI, the opportunities uh, for uh, potentially more income uh, are coming, and also opportunities for jobs uh, in, uh, uh, in in certain outlays that are beyond the traditional, you know, laboratory, uh, private laboratory or academic school. Because there'll be a lot of industry and a lot of rewards to that too. Uh, so I think we can use that. But I agree, we should always uh, continue to show our value. Uh, I think we're in the midst of a third revolution in the field. Uh, I know the focus was here on, on education in this lecture and how to attract people, but don't forget that the AI and, and digital pass, uh, this is uh, a new uh, amazing field for us uh, that's going to enrich us as, as it's doing and it did in the last decade, genomics. So uh, if you look at these two things, uh, that's huge for us and it's going to attract a lot of talent. So I'm really not worried as worried. Uh, I think we don't do a good job advertising uh, ourselves. Uh, but with the change of workforce, uh, which is happening, uh, just you just need to look at Twitter and see uh, the pathologist or pathology residents who engage in Twitter and social media versus uh, my generation. Uh, so clearly, we're, we're going to be a different breed uh, in a decade uh, in a positive way. And uh, and those uh, those are gonna continue to uh, to revolutionize the field and probably uh, with the two areas that I mentioned uh, will will do a better job than us reaching back to medical school and continue to enrich the pipelines. Thank you. I, I also want to point. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead, uh, Brandon. I, I just wanted to make. I just wanted to also point out we. Um, we also have some visitors from South Africa on the call today too, some pathologists who, um, I just wanted to say hi to them as well. Go ahead, Dr. Marcus. Well, thank you for, for, for a wonderful talk. This was really inspiring and, uh, and uh, excellent. Um, I just wanna share a very uh, sh a sh a small experience I've had with teaching and, and publications and something that the, our, our junior my junior colleagues could learn from. So one of the one of the things you need for uh, for promotion is to show that people know you. National recognition, international recognition. Well, in 2007, 13 years ago, I published a paper with a former uh, student of ours and resident, Yara Park. She is now the program director of pathology at UNC, and the title is teaching medical students pr basic principles of laboratory medicine. I still receive emails from ResearchGate that this is the most read article for our department. Several weeks, more than 5,000 reads of one single paper we wrote in a weekend. So people can't, there's so much opportunity because there's so much, so little out there as to how we should be teaching lab medicine in my case. One of our former residents, um, Sarah Bean, has been doing cytopathology teaching at Duke. She has uh, some publications on that. So we could actually have another session on all the things that uh, have been done in this regard from, from UAB. We have a very uh, strong record of, uh, of teaching. 
and people are eager to read. So when you're applying for your uh, for promotion to associate professor, you want to prove that you have national recognition. Said my article has been read four thousand times, and you can even say where it was being read. So there is there is there is room for so much more for us to do. Just sharing the little bit that we know and do here. I'll, uh, I'll just sort of build on what Dr. Netta was talking about social media and, and you think about the new age of publication or recognition. Those of us who are on podcast, you can't even, like I did one, one session, it had 1600 views, live views during the education session. 1600 people heard me talk about how to investigate pediatric deaths. Like I would I would argue that that's reason to be uh, to be excited and to realize that we have an opportunity to have a great outreach. That shows the difference in age, right, Brandy? I, <laughs> well, I thought it would be a nice that little let's loop it around. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> the future is bright. Speaking of that, for those who didn't grow up on social media, I just want to draw attention to the chat. So for people who haven't looked at that, there's been some good comments. Some have been addressed in the discussion, but for those who haven't opened it to read through that as well. Uh, Brandy, uh, that was a very nice talk. Uh, one of my comment was the sometime back, you may recall, uh, we used to, lab medicine used to have a uh, USAM uh, scholars week. So we used to have a, a, a student, a, about eight to 10 students used to rotate through various sections for a week at a stretch. And I didn't know that can be uh, re-looked at. Yeah, that's one way to interact. I, I offer one, Dr. Reddy, remember? I can, I've been offering one since 2008. But that, that, that's a special topics, I believe. Yeah. Um, so special topics are still part of our curriculum. We have a ton of them. I didn't really go into what we already offer. We have a fair amount of rotations. We all have, spe we pretty much all have a special topics week that people can sign up for. Okay. Um, and, but I, what I, what I would like to sort of go back to is we could, we are at a point where we could do this remotely. Like they don't, we, we can, we can do so much. COVID has shown us that we can utilize digital tools, these remote tools to really get the message out. And so um, I've talked to just my own organization uh, name about why, are, why aren't we having like digital lunch and learns, put them on Twitter. Like this is insane. There are people who want to hear about what we do. We should make it easy for them to do so, whether they're here in our medical school or not. This is great. I definitely one of the uh, more robust discussions we've had in Grand Round. So I look forward to keeping this momentum into 2021. Um, and again, thank you for all the external people who visited. Um, this will continue on. Um, are there any other closing comments or discussion points? I, I wanna uh, add to something that uh, Brandy mentioned uh, uh, briefly, which is the idea, and I see it on the on the chat too, the idea that reports patients will be accessing pathology report, which I know we have some trepidation, some of us, if that's like you turn it overnight, uh, so we want to be prepared and we do have time. Uh, but this is a great thing, and that's what Brandy's message, and I know we've had discussions, Brandy and Greg and I, uh, about this. Uh, so, and it's something that we do a lot, and and people don't realize. And it's uh, it's again, I think, uh, depends on the on the pathologist. So, if you get a lot of consultations, uh, it's unusual. They can be sent from your patient. It's not unusual to talk to your patients. And uh, several of our organizations are are trying to push that because this is helpful uh, in uh, in showing the value of our fields and importance. I think uh, we got a silver lining with COVID. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize how important our expertise is. Uh, the pandemic, uh, I know regionally and and nationally, this uh, this helped a lot uh, portray uh, the stars that we have uh, in microbiology in uh, in lab medicine, uh, which a lot of people think of it as just just machines. They don't realize the connection to to a medical scientific uh, uh, professional uh, in our field. So, uh, and, and the, uh, the genomics, I, I, I keep harping, 
uh, on it, uh, the Angelina Jolie effect, I think, was uh, was huge for PATH and uh, BRCA and molecular and diagnostics and and uh, the patent uh, the patent issue about genes that followed and and uh, the association of molecular pathology helped uh, win the day where genes uh, are not patent patentable. Uh, all these things brought attention to the field and uh, and if we continue to be proactive, engage our patients, engage. Uh, through social media, I think this will uh, will be very important for us. And it's like everything, it's a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. You start attracting the kind of people that are more communicative into the field. And, and uh, I have to tell you, if you look at now and you see the impression about PATH, when I went into pathology, it was... Uh, I, I remember going to my first uh, conference uh, uh, in Dallas, and and some of the uh, the shapes and uh, and figures that I saw, I say, oh my God, what am I? Who am I joining? Who are these crowd? Uh, so things change a lot, and uh, I have no doubt that they will continue changing to the positive, in terms of impression and uh, and understanding of what we do and our value. Just so everyone knows, I did, um, of course, um, agree for this to be posted on. We we have a YouTube channel. Sorry, Adam, if you were going to go there, but um, I did agree for it to be recorded and posted, so it should be um, it should be available for your viewing pleasure, sharing pleasure, share it widely, however 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 far it needs to go. Yeah, to try and get those views above sixteen hundred, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Hey, I think well, I did you, get the most app, uh, the most participants, though. Yes, I love I would it. Say that I love it. Everyone, go talk about it. <laughs> get more people with pathology. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everybody. And Brandy, thank you for bringing it home with a slam dunk. That was uh, great. You. So Happy hope holidays. to see you all in 2021. Applicants, Happy virtual holidays. open house tonight. See you. Everyone, <laughs> sign on. <laughs>